Good morning. Before we turn to the scripture, I just have a word of thanks to this congregation for inviting me to be with you this morning. I grew up in Davidson, and Melanie and I have raised our family here in Charlotte, and so it is always good to be back where your roots are deep. But I have to say, I cannot hear the word, two words, Mallard Creek, without thinking about my Little League days in Davidson. Mallard Creek always had the toughest team on the schedule. And the star pitcher of that era was Melvin Hoover. Melvin had a curveball that I just could not hit. And I will tell you, thanks, for you have already shown me much greater hospitality than Melvin ever did. <laughs> Let us turn to the scripture. Our Old Testament reading this morning is Psalm 72, verses 1 through 7. This psalm is written of Solomon. Give thanks, the king... Give the king your, ju your justice, O God, and your righteousness to a king's son. May he judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. May the mountains yield prosperity for the people and the hills in righteousness. May he defend the cause of the poor of the people, give deliverance to the needy, and crush the oppressor. May he live while the sun endures and as long as the moon throughout all generations. May he be like rain that falls on the mown grass, like showers that water the earth. In his days may righteousness flourish and peace abound until the moon is no more. And our New Testament lesson comes from the Gospel of Matthew Second chapter, beginning with the first verse. Listen for the word of God. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all of Jerusalem with him, calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people. He inquired of them, where is the Messiah to be born? They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men, and he learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go, search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word, so that I may go and pay him homage. When they heard the king, they set out, and there... Ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. This is the word of the Lord. Join me in prayer if you would. Gracious and merciful God, we ask that you pour out your spirit upon us in this moment so that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts may be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. And so in our scripture this morning, we see three examples of kingship. We have Solomon. We have Herod the Great. 
And we have a story of kings and a new king and an inbreaking kingdom. Let's look at each of these in turn and see what we might lift from them. A Psalm of Solomon. This psalm was written for his coronation. It was a big, important event in the life of Israel. Solomon would go on to become the greatest of the kings of Israel. He would have the largest empire, the greatest wealth. He would have the honor of building the temple. But when he was anointed king, that's not what he asked for. He went to God in prayer. And now, O oh Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David. Although I'm, I am only a little child, I do not even know how to go in or come out. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, able to be discern between good and evil. And so Solomon asks for the wisdom of the Lord in governing the people. And of course, all of those other things were given to him as well. But what did he mean, a, a mind that would be guided by God? Well, the prophets of the Old Testament tell us exactly. The prophets, without exception, called for justice and righteousness in the land. That was to be the measure of the faithfulness of Israel in the covenant with God. Justice and righteousness. And when the prophets called this out, they called it out specifically for the widow, the orphan, and the alien. Now, why these three groups? What do they have in common? What they have in common is no voice in the courts or the political life of the kingdom of Israel. So a widow, because women could not speak, had no husband to defend her rights. A minor child with no father, an orphan, had no ability to pursue justice in the courts of the king or the courts of the judiciary. And the alien, the alien, these were common at the time. And why was that? The alien also had no voice, but why was it so common that it was important for the prophets to call this out? It's because at the time, borders didn't really matter. People wandered in and out. In fact, Jesus and Joseph and Mary wander down to Egypt when they need to get away. Joseph earlier had gone to Egypt and his family followed when the famine came. People wandered in and out seeking either economic or physical protection. It wasn't about invasion or crimes or jobs. Those things came up when Western democracies arose. And why is that? Borders became important when democracies had to choose the leader. The king, Solomon was still king, Pharaoh was still Pharaoh, but when you get to choose the head of the government, borders become about voting. And so a nation under God is determined, according to the prophets, not by divine right, but by divine justice. In fact, Merriam-Webster has named justice the word of 2018. It was the most searched word on their website in all of 2018. Now that's not surprising because the concept of justice has been at the center of so many of our national debates this past year. Racial justice, social justice, criminal justice, economic justice. In any conversation about these topics, the question of just what we mean when we use the term justice is relevant and part of the discussion. Solomon asked, 
to be guided to God's justice. Herod is quite a different case. Herod the Great consolidated the kingdom through a violent siege of Jerusalem in 37 BCE. In the, in the midst of that conflict, his own brother was killed and he consolidated the kingdom of Judea. He claimed publicly to be a Jew, but encountered criticism at the time because of his decadent lifestyle that was seen as hypocritical by observant Jews. His despotic rule was marked by numerous security actions aimed at suppressing the contempt of the people. He spent lavishly on gifts to his Roman overseers to try to bolster his reputation. He was always afraid of losing power, so much so that he executed his wife, his brother-in-law, three sons, and hundreds of political opponents. Historians agree he suffered from paranoia and although in his own words he aspired to be Judea's greatest builder, he left his people impoverished. The Jewish Encyclopedia concludes, above all, Herod was prepared to commit any crime in order to gratify his unbounded ambition. And so, near the end of his reign, the Magi show up in Jerusalem and they said, we're here to find out where the newborn king of the Jews is. Well, that was Herod's title. He was king of the Jews. This client king of Rome had to do something about this. So he reacts with fear. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened and all of Jerusalem with him. Now, why was that all of Jerusalem frightened? because the idea of a new king of the Jews not only set, upset the political power, it upset the religious establishment, just as Christ himself would do somewhere between 32 and 33 years later when he rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. The same issues would be at play. So, he's got the place because the scribes have told him Bethlehem is where the Messiah will be born. But he doesn't know the exact time. So he calls the, the wise men in and he says, when did this star appear? I need to get some more information. And they give him the exact time the star appeared. And he says, well, good, you go and find this child so that I too then can go worship him. Well, knowing what we know about Herod, I don't think we can take him at his word. Any ruler who has killed his wife and brother-in-law and sons and others would think nothing of killing a small child to retain power. And so he sends them out, but they go home by another route. And what we will read in the next passage of Scripture Herod then calls for the slaying of the innocents. He says that all male children born in Bethlehem under age two should be put to the sword. This is not God's justice. This is not God's wisdom. This is ego and paranoia run amok. And our third group, the Magi. We call them kings. I love the hymn we're going to sing in a few minutes, We Three Kings of Orient Are. But it's important to separate tradition from what the scripture actually says. Scripture never says they're kings. We've adopted that, but it's not in there anywhere to find. Nor are there three of them. It doesn't say how many there were. There were three gifts, and so we have come to the tradition of representing one king, one gift, but it doesn't say that either. Nor are their names Gaspar, Balthazar, and Melchior. Those names were given to the Magi, the, the supposed three Magi, six or 800 years later. 
nor do they represent, as others have proposed, that they are the ethnic tribes of Noah's three sons. The three parallels seem to work pretty well, and I will go along with the idea that they represent all of the world outside of Judaism. That's going to be important. And I apologize for those like me who love our Christmas pageants and our creches, both of which I am eager to see every year. They probably don't show up at the stable either. Here we are on Epiphany, the day we celebrate the arrival of the Magi, and it happens to be 12 days after Christmas. But remember, we celebrate Jesus' life all through the year. It's not sequential. Next week, we're going to celebrate Jesus' baptism when he was about 30 years old. What can we know from Scripture about the visit of the Magi? So in Luke, when we hear the babe, the newborn babe, is laid in the manger, the word, the Greek word that the gospel writer uses is brephos, which means infant or newborn. So right after Mary gave birth, she wrapped up the child and laid it in the manger there in the stable. But the word that Matthew uses is peidion. That's where we get our word pediatrics. It means, that happens to be a masculine declination, it means a little boy. In fact, when Jesus in chapter 19 of Matthew says, let the little children come unto me, he uses this same word, peidia. It means little child. It doesn't necessarily mean infant. But our biggest clue that they're probably not still in the stable is actually Herod's action of his own. Why two years? It probably would have taken the Magi, who were astronomers from either Persia now Iran, or Babylon, months, yes, years to get there. They saw the star rise in the east. They weren't sure what that portent meant. They had to go back through scriptures and calculations. And once they decided it was a Jewish king, then they had to organize a trip over hundreds of miles of desert, dozens of camels, hundreds of servants, water, food, tents, and then the travel itself would take months to get to Jerusalem. And so what is likely is that they arrive, and we hear the word house, not stable. They go in and see the little child. It is important to hear what the scripture really says. And finally, what I would say is that this word magi, the actual Greek word is magoi, Anywhere you see the O-I plural, it means more than one. More than one man or men and women. Now, culturally, it's likely that they were all men. I acknowledge that. But grammatically, it could have been a mixed group. And just as we have decided that the Greek word presbyteroi, elders, ruling elders on the session, teaching elders in the pulpit are both men and women. Magoi can include both genders. And so I choose to translate it not as wise men, but as wise people. So why did these wise people who represent the entire earth beyond the Jewish culture come to worship this small child, this anointed one. It says when they came in, not that they kneeled, that's uh, our thought process. It says they prostrated themselves, lay face down on the dirt floor with their hands in submission. It is the most humbling position one can take before a king. And that humbling of all the earth is a cosmic recognition of Jesus Christ as Lord. But they also give a temporal gift. 
frankincense, gold, and myrrh. These were the gifts to a king. And it recognizes Jesus' worldly kingship as well. And so if all of the world is bowing down and recognizing Jesus as the Lord of the cosmos and the Lord of this moment as well, it is a recognition of God's reign, God's inbreaking kingdom over and against the excesses of the culture at the time as embodied in King Herod. And I would say over and against the excesses of the culture as we turn to the new year 2019 in our very midst. God's kingdom is breaking in. And if it is God's rule, thinking back to Solomon and the prophets, then it is a rule of righteousness and justice for the poor and needy. For our own Lord tells us in Matthew 25, to the extent you do it to the least of these, you have done it to me. And so, dear friends at Mallard Creek Presbyterian Church, are we all ready to be wise people? In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.